We will move on to the um, last speaker of the session, uh, Dr. Uh, Sarah Mitchell. Yeah. I've known Sarah for about 10 years now. We used to be postdocs together in Baltimore. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce her to the stage. She's now in, in uh, Zurich. Whenever you're ready. Can anyone, everyone hear me? Yes, okay, perfect, great. Uh, so thank you, Morden, for the invitation to be here. It's nice after, I guess, what, five years to finally meet each other again in Copenhagen and you know, to come to this great conference, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, today I'm gonna share some of our work on late-life interventions for improving health span in mice. So most of the people in this room will probably know that calorie restriction, it was one of the first interventions shown to extend lifespan and health span in rodents. Uh, this graph is really cool because it's from 1935 before they you know, had sort of Excel and stuff to uh, make graphs. So it's a cool hand-drawn graph which shows that as you restrict calories in rats, uh, you end up with extended lifespan. And so this paper was actually also really cool because if you read really closely, it talks about the fur of the white rats. Um, and so they sort of potentially introduce the concept of health span, where he talks about how calorie restriction improves the fur of the uh, rats. Um, and so this sort of concept would now become, come to be known as health span. Uh, but one of the challenges with translating calorie restriction is that not everyone wants to eat less for the rest of their life. Um, and so we're interested in identifying alternatives to lifelong food restriction. And one of those alternatives is, of course, pharmacological lifespan extension. And over the past few years, there's been quite a number of drugs uh, across different sort of mechanisms and classes, which have been shown to extend lifespan in rats, mice, um, such as rapamycin, metformin, probably some of the most famous, resveratrol, of course. And so we became interested in this uh, new class of drugs called uh, MET-AP2 inhibitors um, as both novel longevity and obesity therapeutics. And this sort of came apart through a collaboration with a pharmaceutical company in Boston called Zafgen, um, where they were developing these uh, methionine aminopeptidase inhibitors um, for different forms of obesity. And here is just sort of the target um, showing its interaction. And so initially we had started this collaboration looking at uh, the mechanism of action of these uh, novel MET-AP2 inhibitors uh, with the focus on Prader-Willi disease. And so as shown here, this is a young child who has Prader-Willi disease. It's a genetic obesity condition, extremely severe. Uh, basically all therapeutics tried to date have failed. Um, and so it's really really a sort of a unmet need for um, novel therapeutics. And so we had tested uh, this compound called Zafgen 1062, which we refer to as 1062, in our obese mice and found that when you feed mice a high fat diet, you get insulin resistance, steatosis, liver weight, um, increased liver enzymes. But remarkably, remarkably, when you treat the mice with uh, 1062, so this is really cool because the mice continue to eat the high-fat diet um, supplemented with the drug. And what we see is a complete reversal of steatosis here, uh, reduction in liver weight, as well as reversal of sort of liver damage. And so what we sort of noticed was that a lot of the phenotypes that we see with our 1062 treated mice are also common with um, increased longevity. So maintenance of a healthy body weight, you know, not being too fat, being insulin sensitive. And so we thought, well, let's see how this works in old mice. And so we set up a study looking at uh, late onset lifespan intervention. We used male and female black six mice, and we randomized them to one of four diets, a control diet, a pear-fed diet, a methionine-restricted methionine diet, as well as our drug 1062. And so this was quite cool because across, across the lifespan, we measured every three months um, different health span parameters, as well as collecting things like blood, urine, fecal samples. Um, and this came out to a study of about 600 mice. And from all these mice, we have every single parameter shown here every three months across their lifespan. So we have this huge data set of information looking at every individual mouse. And so 
one of the things that we found is that our uh, drug, 1062, actually causes a reduction in food intake of about 15%. So to control for that, we have this pear-fed or calorie-restricted uh, group who eat the same amount of calories as our 1062 mice without the drug. And so basically, this works out to about a mild calorie restriction of about 15%. And so when you think about like, doing interventions in mice, why would you do late-life interventions? Well, it's cheaper, because you don't need to keep the mice around for as long. Um, it takes less time. And as someone who's done so many longevity studies starting at four months of age, it's nice to sort of do a shorter study. And also, it's potentially more translational, translationally relevant. Um, so here is a nice just graph from Jax, basically showing the uh, equivalence between human and mouse ages. And what we did is we started our interventions at about 21 to 22 months of age, which is shown here in the blue arrows. And it basically corresponds to a human who's about 65. And why this is important is because some people might want to take drugs from when they're 20, 30, 40 for the rest of their life. But there's also a population of people who don't want to do that. And so maybe targeting a late life intervention where we start it a little bit later in life, before the decline is starting, might be more acceptable to them. And so we measured our lifespan. And on the right here, you see the lifespan curve for the males um, with our four different interventions. Um, so you see the control in black, our methionine restriction in blue, our drug 1062 in red, and our calorie-restricted or pear-fed group in orange. And basically, what you see is some interesting uh, stuff with the curve. And so with our methionine restriction group, what's quite interesting is that we have this early mortality in the males, shown here. But then sort of something happens, and it kicks in, and we get like this later life, uh, oops, this late life um, extension. We see that our calorie restriction and pear fed, um, our pear fed and our 1062 groups uh, does extend lifespan uh, to varying degrees of significance. Um, and then when we look at the females, we see quite a different thing, which is quite interesting. We see that we have our interventions have a stronger effect in females. Uh, females overall live shorter. Um, and that our 1062 intervention actually gives a really significant extension of uh, lifespan, as shown here in the box. And what's interesting is that it looks like it's sort of squaring the curve to a small extent, uh, improving health span as well as extending lifespan. And so this was quite interesting, and obviously it was very exciting. Another thing which is quite cool about the different interventions is that while we see this early life mortality in our male methionine-restricted mice, we do not see this in females. And then this here just shows the combined lifespan um, of the males and females with the different significant levels. And so when I'm sort of looking at different intervention studies, one thing I'm always interested in is knowing what do the mice die of. Um, so with every animal that died, which was, as I said, about 600 mice, we did a pathology at death. And so this is really gross and kind of not a fun job for someone to do. But this is basically preliminary data just looking at gross necropsy. And so when the animal dies, we open the animal, we look at all the different organs. And we just ask a question, does the organ look normal or does it look abnormal? And so here is just some data from uh, liver and spleen showing that with our interventions, um, we seem to see a higher percent of normal looking organs. And so of course, this is just growth, gross pathology. We have prepared all the slides and are getting ready to send them out for a more in-depth uh, pathology analysis. We measured body weight trajectories across the lifespan, and we see that our interventions uh, reduce body weight, which is great. Um, we see sort of different trajectories in males versus females. And then we also measured food intake across the study. So we wanted to make sure that our pear-fed animals, so again, these are the animals that are being uh, eating the same amount of calories as our drug group, are actually reaching that target. And what we see is, yes, we were able to do that. And the amount of food that they eat relative to the control in black is about 10 to 15% less. And what's interesting is that even though they are eating 10 to 15% less, our drug animals, shown here in the red, are still weighing considerably less. 
And so because we did see this, food, this uh, reduction in food intake, we wanted to make sure that it was real, and we've sort of confirmed this in additional studies looking at feeding, different feeding paradigms, and find that, yes, it is true that what we're seeing with the reduction in food intake with our drug animals is correct. And so lifespan extension is great, but we're also interested in health span extension. And so, as was just mentioned, we also use the uh, Howlett Mouse Clinical Frailty Index. And as shown here in this graph, we have the frailty measures across the lifespan for both male and female mice. And this was done with the help of Alice Kane in uh, David Sinclair's lab while we're at Harvard. And so, what's quite interesting is that you see sex-specific differences in the trajectories of frail, frailty in males versus females. Um, so you see here, in black, the males are quite frail, they become more frail with time, whereas our interventions, to varying degrees, reduce frailty uh, over time. And then what's interesting in the, in the females, at least in our cohort, is that we don't really see any differences in frailty between uh, our intervention groups in the females. And so they're all about the same amount of frailty, we don't really see a change in frailty until we get to this point later in life where um, you sort of have a survivor effect, um, and so the data is less reliable because you have less mice. But what's interesting is that even though we see no difference in our frailty in females with our drug intervention or our diet intervention, we saw that they live considerably longer compared to the control. So that sort of just raises an interesting point between lifespan and frailty. And so here is just another graph showing uh, frailty index over time. And so what this shows here on this axis is the change um, in frailty at the follow-up times, 24, 27, 30 months, et cetera, and comparing the, whoops, the frailty index compared to baseline. So if you're having a data point around zero, it means that between baseline and this follow-up time point, you're not seeing really any change in frailty. And so what we see, as with the previous graph I showed, was that with females in our interventions, the frailty is sort of staying at around the same uh, level. It's only later in life that then we start to see this effect of our interventions kicking in to reduce frailty. And again, with males, we see that over time, controls become oops, sorry, more frail and that our interventions significantly reduce frailty at all of the follow-up time points. And I guess what's an interesting point to note is that if you remember our uh, methionine-restricted males had a reduction in frailty early on in their life, or sorry, uh, early mortality, um, here you can see that there is no real difference in frailty between control and methionine-restricted sort of early on. But later in life, when, this, when we started to see that kick in and the extension and lifespan is then when we really start to see a reduction in frailty, which was quite cool. And then this is another graph just looking at the association between frailty index and remaining time to live. And basically we find that the lower your frailty, the longer you have to live, which sort of makes sense. And we see this in both males and females, irrespective of intervention. We're also interested in looking at what's going on uh, in the blood of these animals um, over age and with our interventions. And so we have a nice sort of clinical hematology analyzer where we can easily measure things like neutrophil and lymphocyte levels. Um, and so what you see here is just the change in the individual levels with each dot rep representing uh, one data point. And we see that even though the absolute values of the measures are lower in females, the effects of the interventions, so the trajectories, appear to be the same across males and females. And so what we see is that our interventions lower both neutrophil and lymphocyte number with our 1062 intervention having the strongest effect in males. And then we see the same thing for white blood cells uh, with the interventions that extend lifespan, particularly our 1062 and MR in the females. Um, interestingly, we see an increase in the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio over time, um, which is you know, quite a strong increase in our drug-treated animals. Um, and this is kind of interesting because in humans, generally, an elevated neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is associated with shorter lifespan. So this is sort of something that seems quite interesting that we're interested to follow up on.
And then across the study, uh, we also had a time point where after six months on the intervention, we sacrificed a cohort of animals and did really sort of in-depth, uh, complex phenotyping of these uh, mice. And so this is just some preliminary data from our uh, microbiome uh, study where we have the males and the females just looking at sort of the separation of the micro microbiome between the different uh, interventions. And what we see that really is that sex is the predominant driver of the variation. So you see that in the females, sort of the interventions kind of overlay each other to a greater extent than what we see in males. And here is just the relative abundance of some of the different uh, common phylum uh, observed in our animals. And what was interesting that we found was that this uh, one veromicrobia um, was significantly, or was increased to a greater relative abundance in our males in both the methionine and 1062 groups. And this is quite interesting. Um, and when we looked, we found that it was actually uh, acomancia. And this is quite interesting because uh, in obesity, high levels of this bacteria are associated with uh, improved outcomes, uh, both metabolic outcomes and gut barrier functions. So this might suggest that there's something going on and some changes in the gut with age uh, with our interventions that are maybe making, um, having a positive effect on lifespan. So sort of to summarize, what we see is a late life extension with uh, our dietary and pharmacological in interventions, and we show that it is possible. Uh, we see this reduction in food intake with our drug-treated mice. Um, and what we really find is that the pear feeding is not sufficient to explain all of the benefits that we see with our 1062. We also see sex-specific changes of frailty across the lifespan, um, and what we really think the mechanism by which our drug is working to improve health span and lifespan does involve some aspect of uh, regulation of food intake. And so I'd just like to finish by um, thanking all of our collaborators, um, both at Harvard Medical School as well as the School of Public Health, um, our collaborators, collaborators at ETH, our lab at ETH, our you know, Copenhagen collaborators, Morton and Daniela. Um, our funding sources. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Really great presentation, as always. Um, we have some, uh, do we have any questions in the room? We have a question from James here. Oh, we have a question from Lisa first. Fabulous talk. Thank you. So fascinating. Um, what, what uh, these sex differences bring to mind is that in neonates, mm -hmm. also it is males that are the, the weaker sex. Um, so it's, it really is across the, the lifespan. Um, but I was just thinking, in terms of the gut microbiome, mm -hmm. this is the first time I see it so such a clear distinction. Has anyone else looked in these huge data sets to see if, there, if these sex differences uh, still stand? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, there might be something out there that I just haven't discovered yet, but yeah, I mean, we're obviously very interested in sex differences in all of our health span outcomes, so yeah, we're also very excited to see Great. that thank outcome. You. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. While we get the microphone to James, we can take one from, uh, from online, which is from Andrea Olsen, our uh, high school uh, Inspire ambassador. You mentioned that mice taking the uh, 1062 drug weighed less than those with a caloric deficit diet. Do you have any hypothesis as to why this happens? I mean, it's definitely a reduction in food intake that's primarily driving the weight loss phenotype. Why it's more in the 1062 mice than in the pear-fed or CR mice, we're still looking into that. Okay. Very cool. Great question. Um, then there is uh, a question from James, yes, sorry. AP2 inhibitors have had kind of a difficult yes. path in humans, yep. um, to put it lightly. Yep. And so I'm curious how you think about that toxicity signal mm -hmm. that has appeared in some of the clinical trials as you try to interpret the longevity mm -hmm. data you've generated. Great question. Um, I kind of don't want to give away too much because one of my colleagues is speaking tomorrow about more of the mechanism of you know, the action. Um, yeah, so maybe stay tuned for that. Yeah, thanks. Sounds very, sounds very, very exciting. 
Um, I think we will uh, stop now. And uh, Sarah, if you can go online on Slack, also answer some questions there. Thank you. <laughs>